Before we start the show, let's go ahead and hit record on the recorder. Okay, so let's do your station ID thingy deal. All right. Hey, it's Justin Skinner, and I'm from the Professional Failure Podcast, and I'm here today on Jeff's Vroom Vroom Veer Podcast. Perfect. Well done. I was a little too good, but that's okay. You want me to do it again? I'll do it again. No, 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 (laughs) no. Yeah, do it again and screw up on purpose next time. Perfect. Yeah, Yeah, it's perfect. I'm going to hit stop. I'll be right back. Yeah. Are you ready to thoughtfully steer away from your revved up, frenzied, and far too often scripted life? Then welcome to Vroom Vroom Veer with Jeff Smith, where he guides you down the road differently traveled by sharing unique experiences with guests who have managed to shift away from a life stuck on cruise control and veered their way into a more authentic and fulfilling one in all sorts of interesting and kind of remarkable ways. Get ready to Vroom Vroom Veer with your differently traveled road chauffeur, Jeff Smith. Terry Tucker, thank you so much for being on Vroom Vroom Beer and welcome to the show. How's it going? It's going great, Jeff. Thanks for having me on. I'm really looking forward to talking with you. Yeah, we're already having fun. You're checking out my beach scene. I'm looking at your office over there. It looks pretty awesome. Nobody can see the video and it's awesome. Okay. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so you are at motivationalcheck.com. So talk a little bit about what you're most excited about in your business today. Yeah, motivationalcheck.com is something I started a couple of years ago, and, and it's really just a, a motivation, inspiration type website. Every day I put up a, a thought for the day, and with that thought comes a question about maybe how you can apply the thought in your life. On Mondays, I put up the Monday morning motivational message, which if you're drunk, you can't say that three times fast. <laughs> Um, but, but that's usually a video or a story or something that's a, l- a little bit a uh, little bit longer. But I always say, if you need a quick hit of inspiration or motivation, go to motivationalcheck.com. Also, you can get access to my book there. The book is called Sustainable Excellence, The 10 Principles to Leading Your Uncommon and Extraordinary Life. And I've also recently just started a membership off the book. Cool. Great title called Sustainable Excellence Membership. So (laughs) sustainableexcellencemembership.com will get you to the membership. All right. We'll link to all of that in the show notes. So don't let me forget, okay? Remind me as we're closing up because I linked to motivationalcheck.com, but not the other one. So remind me. Okay. I'll do that for you. Okay. Thank you. All right. So before we get started talking about like going back in time, vroom, vroom, beer style, we're going to say, you're going to tell me a story that uh, is about MJ. Okay, with no further information. <laughs> we're not going to do it yet, but later on, we're going to talk about the story related to MJ. Who's MJ? Is it Michael Jackson? Is it Michael Jordan? Is it some other MJ? We don't know, but <laughs> stay tuned. Okay, so uh, let's go back in time. And I love this question. This is a, a more fun question for me. Uh, what is your earliest memory? That tickles, well, earliest tickles memory the brain cell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I honestly, my my earliest memory is my my grandparents had gotten me this big stuffed dog that was bigger than me, <laughs> and it was called Fluffy. Okay, and, and and literally, I remember kind of crawling all over and playing with Fluffy like it was a real dog, but you know, it would just sit there and do anything. So that's really, I, I think, the earliest memory I can remember. How uh, old were you? Do, you? do you know? Oh God, I, I no young. no clue. Like a baby, two, maybe two. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that really burned some some brain cells there. It did. Fluffy. It did. I remember the room. <laughs> I remember it being in the corner of the room. I wow. remember all that. And yeah. you were just tackling it. You were just like I was. I was mean, rolling all over it. All, yeah, it was. Great. I'm gonna see if I can eat this. <laughs> yeah. As kids do. That's awesome. Okay. So, uh, where did you grow up? South side of Chicago. Oh, nice. Okay. You don't, you don't, you know, I grew up in uh, Upper Peninsula, Michigan. So I had family friends that were from Chicago. I don't know if they're North side or South side, South side. So they, they were not Cub fans. They were Sox fans. So, well, yeah, I was, I was South side and I'm a Cubs fan. Okay. So, so, okay. So that you went, you went the wrong way. Is that the, I went to the dark side. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> okay, so we're both Midwesterners. That's that's yes. good. And uh, and I'm a Packer fan, and you're a Bears fan. So I am. Uh, uh, yes. Hey, Fields is good. That's all I'll say. <laughs> Well, we'll see what happens. Yeah. I, I mean, I live in Denver now, so, you know, it, it's all about Russell Wilson and the Broncos. We'll see what happens with them this year. Yeah. Okay. You've got hope on both fronts. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hedging my bets. Believe me. <laughs> well, you know, I, I live in Vegas, but I'm not really a Raiders fan. But now that Devonte Adams moved out here, I might actually watch some more games like yeah. Raider games. Yeah. And if the Packers ever show up here, I might actually buy a ticket, but they're real expensive. <laughs> oh, I bet they are. It's a beautiful yeah. stadium. though. It's I gorgeous. Mean, but I mean, it's crazy. Just getting the cheap seats is just nuts. It's yeah, yeah it's crazy. Anyway, I'm not, you know, to be honest, I'd rather watch football on TV. Okay. So, uh, tell us a little bit about what your childhood was like growing up there in, uh, Chicago. Yeah, my childhood w- was great. I am I'm the oldest of three boys. You can't okay. tell this from my voice, but I'm I'm six foot eight inches tall. Oh my and god! Well- <laughs> I know. And, and, and I played college basketball at the right. Citadel. I have, okay. I have a brother who's six foot seven who was my a goodness. pitcher for the University of Notre Dame. Wow. Another brother who's six foot six who was drafted by the Cleveland Cavaliers in the National Basketball Association. Okay. And then my dad was six five. So I sort of joked that. You know, if you sat behind our family in church growing up, not a prayer's chance you're going to see anything that was going on, you know, in, in, in front. But our five foot eight inch mother was always the boss. You know, it didn't matter how big, tall, strong we were, whatever right. mom said right. was kind of the way it went. But my parents really kind of instilled in us what family was all about, the importance of of caring about each other, of supporting each other, of loving each other. And, and my parents did what I call sort of divide and conquer parenting where it would be like, you know, Terry's got a game over here. Dad will go to that. Larry's got a practice over here. Mom will go to that. Right. So we were always running in a million different directions okay. about that. And for a short period of time, I, I lived in Columbus, Ohio. Right. And I was incredibly lucky because I got on a, my very first basketball team was just a little wreck thing, you know, in a, sort of a, a, an auditorium that doubled as a lunchroom at, and, a, and, a bas- and a gymnasium and everything for this, gotcha. this public school. Right. But I was on the same team with the son of the assistant basketball coach at Ohio State. Wow. And so okay. I got, you know, I went to the summer basketball camps. I got to do all that kind of fun stuff and things like that. And that really encouraged and sort of lit the fuse for my interest in basketball, which I was able to carry out all through college. That's awesome. So basically you, uh, I, I had like relatives that were like that, like every, all the kids were deep into sports. Right. So that means that like mom and dad are just like, it's like their part-time job. If they're, you know, if they're not working, uh, they're usually going to one game or another football, basketball, baseball. Right. So, uh, so, okay. Sports yeah. family. So, all that. Let yeah. me ask you this. So you've got all these tall, handsome men. <laughs> well, at least one out of two. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, I've noticed something that like there, there's a lot of like, I don't know why this is. I'm sure there's lots of theories, but it seems like tall dudes end up being like in leadership roles a lot, quite often. Is, did this track in your family? It, it did in, <laughs> in a lot of ways. I, right. I mean, you, you, you know, you walk into a room and everybody turns and looks at you. you right. You know, you, it, it's, it's just mammalian, you know, it, it is. Yeah. And, you, you know, right. I've got a daughter who is six foot two, who got my height. Right. And also had an NBA three point range and actually went to play basketball at the United States Air Force Academy. Wow. And she's even noticed it, too, that, you know, you walk in and, you know, people mm-hmm. just turn and look. They don't right. say anything. They're, sure. they're they're kind of scared of you. So <laughs> right. yeah, you, right. you get leadership, you know, positions just because everybody's afraid of you and they don't <laughs> want to say no to you. So yeah, it works that way too. <laughs> Have you ever heard this theory of quarterback face? No. No. So you know how like most quarterbacks are like six foot something and handsome? Yeah. So the idea of quarterback face is like the Pop Warner coaches look around at the kids, yeah. look for tall, handsome kids. And they go, oh, yeah, okay. I bet you that kid's smart enough to be a quarterback, right? They, they're, not, they're not like – they haven't like done any sort of physical challenges yet. They just pick them out, you know? 
<laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, I, yeah, because they look like the role they're going they're going to put them in. Basically, yeah, physically, just like big, you know, kind of yeah. overweight guys look like linemen. Correct. You know? It's like, hey, you're yeah. gonna be on the line. Every so, yeah. every body type sort of has a a built in sort of position for you. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, mine was left out. <laughs> I I played uh, one year of uh, uh, my freshman year. I played football in high school, and uh, we we ran this really exotic sort of offense called single wing. Have you ever heard of single wing? No. It's 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 extra weird. So the tailback is the throwing back. The fullback okay. is the blocking back, and okay. the quarterback is actually the fullback was the running back. The quarterback was the lead blocker, mm. and also. If, if I only had two plays um, that I wasn't lead blocker and they were both sweeps. Okay. So I was the sweep back and the lead blocker, but I was tiny. <laughs> so they, that was about the only, they, I kind of looked smart, right? So uh, right. I think, I, I guess, because I wasn't big enough to be a lead blocker, right? Not even close. So I would run through the hole and just get blasted. <laughs> So needless to say, I didn't play much. <laughs> well, you, you, you were a good team player. You gave up your body, you know, yeah, to, I did. the back I to did. move I, down I the I was field, trying to so. make somebody trip over me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Fill up the hole at least. Uh, I remember uh, the coach in practice said, uh, so he said, Jeff, I want you to run as fast as you can like a madman uh, at Rich. And Rich was our uh, running back, okay? And also really like short, but very stout. Okay. And, you know, just muscle <laughs> and scrappy. And uh, so uh, Rich uh, squared his shoulders and threw this thing at me. And, uh, and I was running at him like a madman, like Whoa! <laughs> full speed. And I literally, you know, he hit me and I flew. <laughs> It was an I hear you. yeah. It was an excellent demonstration of how to like you know go through the man. <laughs> Would have made a great TikTok video, I'm sure. Right? Oh yeah. man. Uh, now let's. I I, I kind of don't want to go back and make it. <laughs> no, I don't blame you. I no, wouldn't either. No. Okay. So all right. So let's see here. Uh, let's dig into these questions. So, how would you describe a perfect day when you were young? You know, I'm old enough to remember where you left the house in the morning and pretty much came back dinner you know, time when when somebody called you and, and that yeah. kind of and and you know this was even before I got into sports was just hanging out with the neighborhood kids. You know, you right. always knew where the kids were because you just found all the bicycles laying in the garage or in the driveway. Okay, you know, and that's where all the kids they were at that house or there, there were some houses being built and some. Uh, construction piping and stuff like that. Okay. We used to go over there, grab a, a stick, a safety pin and a string and fish. There were no fish in the water. You know, it was a storm <laughs> runoff pipe, you know, but we would sit there for hours just talking and Hey, what are we going to do Hanging later? And stuff right. Like right. That. Yeah. So it was just, it was just being with a bunch of guys and hanging out and right. doing dumb stuff. Right. That, yeah. You know, we probably shouldn't have done that today. You know, you got to have a helmet on and you can't do that. And you can't cross that street. I know. And, and that that's what we did. But we also lived at a time where if I did something wrong, you know, uh, Mrs. Tripp, you know, down the street would grab me, spank me on the bottom, send me home, pick up the phone and call my mother. Right. And then when I got home, my mother would kick my butt. You know, right. so it, it, it was... It really was. But you were out there and you were out there. You were probably occasionally hurting yourself a little bit. Yeah, right. Occasionally. Occasionally. And that's all good for you, you know? Yeah. Yeah, we were drinking out of the hose and we were doing (laughs) you know all that stuff. (laughs) Yeah, me too. See, so I was kind of like the small town country kid, so... We were uh, we would we would play games like kick the can and freeze tag and and then like I, I remember like playing lost in space like pretending like uh, this porch is the spaceship and now we're on a mission on the on the lost in sp- lost in space planet you know and and I'm Doctor Smith because my name's Smith so I'm yeah. gonna do something bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just uh, I I loved making up games you know. 
Yeah. I mean, we played football. We put, you know, right. we'd go play, play baseball football in the street, the high school. All right. <laughs> you know, I mean, you were in we a... didn't have enough people. You know, it's like, okay, you go out in the field, I'll bat. Right, uh, you right, right. And, and right. I'll go out in your play. I, right, I mean, right. it was just, we, we did whatever we did, but we were active. You know, we weren't right. sitting around playing computer games. We right. were always out outside doing on your bike, running on around. My bike, yeah, all yeah. over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a different experience for you. Because, like, being in Chicago, theoretically, you know, you could get in trouble. You could. You could. Uh, me, not so much. I mean, like, it's small town. You know, we, yeah. you know, when I don't, I don't remember really ever going much further than the block around my house, you know, unless there was a bigger kid around. Anyway. So, okay. Yeah. That sounds about really close to my perfect day as a kid. Yeah. Okay, so if you could talk to a younger version of yourself, what would you say? Don't be so afraid. Take more uh, chances. Ah, wow. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I, I mean that. Even today, you know, it was like, right. don't, just do it. You right, know, and, right. and when I speak to groups of young people, especially, I always tell them, if there's something in your heart, something in your soul, yeah. that you believe you're supposed to do, right. but it scares you, right. Go ahead and do it do because it. at the yeah. end of your life, the things you're going to regret are not going to be the things you did. Right. They're going to be the things you didn't do. Right. Right. And it's going to be totally. too late to go back and do them. Yes. Oh yeah. I have the, these very specific moments of when, uh, I don't know if I was afraid. I was, I was probably trying to be a little bit too, res too responsible. I remember we went on a, a graduation road trip to, uh, have you ever heard of, uh, uh, Damn it. There's this uh, big outdoor amphitheater like in Racine, Wisconsin. It's close to Chicago or Milwaukee, maybe? Alpine, yeah, I, Alpine Valley? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Alpine yeah. Valley. Okay. Yeah. So we, we all piled a bunch of kids into my buddy's dad's Suburban. And we went to see the, the rock band Boston in Alpine oh, yeah. Valley. More than a feeling. Yeah. <laughs> and after the concert... Uh, my friends picked up some girls, right? And we brought them back to our hotel room and they were playing cards and, you know, playing kissy face and making out. And what did I do? I went to bed. <laughs> so if I could go tell that kid trying to sleep and be a good guy and be ready to drive the next day, I'd say, get the hell out of bed. <laughs> go play kissy face. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Learn something. What do you, get? <laughs> you, you know, if you need to nap tomorrow, somebody else can drive, you know, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you can take turns anyway. Some things are worth being exhausted over. right? A amen. Yes. Playing kissy face when you're 16 or 17 or how over the whole, uh, probably 17. All right. So let's see, this is one of my favorites. Did you get in trouble? And what's the worst thing you ever did when you were younger? Ah, <laughs> You know, I, I was a pretty good kid. I, I mean, my mom and dad raised us. I mean, we had to answer every adult. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. You know, yes, gotcha. sir. No, sir. Gotcha. That, that's the way right. we were brought up. But my parents also knew who my friends were. Okay. So, you know, it's like, you're not hanging around with that kid. He's a knucklehead. You know, he's right. going to get you in trouble on that. So, <laughs> Balloon so it, <laughs> Yeah. So I, I didn't really, I, I didn't get into, you know, I mean, it was just, you know, the dumb stuff. You know, why weren't you home when you said you were going to be home? Okay. Well, I was with my guy, you know, my boys and stuff, you know, right. and stuff like that. So I never really. Never got in trouble. I, uh, well, Not in real trouble anyway. Well, I, you know, I remember one time my mom and dad were leaving and this was when I was really young. They were leaving to go out and we had a babysitter and I was, I mean, I was young, you know, maybe four or something like that. And my dad's like, go upstairs and brush your teeth, you know, before you go to bed. And so I go stomping up the stairs and I'm in the bathroom, you know, like, I can't believe my dad, you know, and I'm just you know, Livid. very upset saying <laughs> things I shouldn't say with my parents. Well, I didn't realize my dad was on the other side of the bathroom door Oops. and heard everything I was saying. So immediately upon coming out, you know, I was grabbed by the back of my shirt, lifted up and be like, you're in bed for the rest of the night. Oh, wow. You know, so, whoops. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, my parents were pretty strict. I mean, I they let us do a lot of things, but yeah. we didn't get away with talking back or mouthing off or to anybody. Right. That's you know, good. I mean, we they'd go to That's parent good. teachers' night and it would be like, yeah. I better not hear one bad thing from your teacher oh, about yeah. you. I mean, today yeah. it's like, 
if there's a problem with the kid, it's the teacher's fault. It's certainly not the parents. I you know? know it is so awful. You know, I, I, if this, I, I had a, a deployment to Saudi Arabia for 59 days way back when I think it was 2002, if I'm guessing right. And, uh, <clears throat> there was this very young, pretty airman. So she was like a E3, right? So she had only been in for a little while. Right. But her parents did not teach her any of those lessons. And nobody in her, act, uh, her you know, regular life job in California <clears throat> had any sort of disciplinary action towards her. So she was just constantly mouthing off to anybody who walked in the office, right? So it could be anybody, like... Hi, Airman, whatever your name is. Um, can you help me with this? No, that's not my job. And then walk away. Right? I'm like, <clears throat> okay. good team player. Yeah, that's not acceptable. <laughs> you yeah. know, it, and and the worst of it was, it had been happening before I got there, and it continued to happen after I I, I was there. And um, so the the first sergeant was sort of like the disciplinarian guy, right? But he had this thing where he didn't want to write anything down, right? Mm -hmm. And in the Air Force, you can't really do anything. I mean, you can yell at people, but that doesn't really... She was not being responding to an ass chewing, okay? Gotcha. So um, I, you know, went and talked to the first sergeant, and, and he was like, no, I'm not going to write anything down, right? And I'm like, well, yelling at her hasn't worked. <laughs> right. So... It happened again, and I said, look, I'm going to write something down. You don't have to like it, but if she's my troop, I'm writing it down. Right. And, and then he wanted to go all the way, right, uh, way too hard, and, mm -hmm. and he's just like has a fit, and he's like, fine, do this, do that, do this. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> here's my plan, right? I'm just going to write a letter, and I'm not going to do anything about it, but I'm going to make her sign it and said, you know, basically in you know, Air Force ease, I acknowledged I was naughty, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> right? And I won't do it again, I promise, signed Airman Snotty, right? First off, she didn't want to sign it, uh, all right? And I was like, that's okay, I'll get somebody else to sign it. It's just, it's just witnessing that you, you, were, you were given this that, letter, right? Counseling. Right. right. So eventually she came around to, to, take, to sign the counseling letter, and I said, look, I'm not, this is not going anywhere. I'm going to put it in a folder in my desk with your name on it. And if you shape up and you are professional and treat people with courtesy and respect, I will throw that away. If you don't, if there's one more thing, I'm going to mail this to your commander at home. And she's like, you can't do that. I'm like, okay. All right. You believe Watch what me. you want to believe. <laughs> so she went and talked to the staff sergeant and she said, can he do that? And she's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> so she was really nice after that. She didn't like me at all. She wouldn't speak to me, but that's okay. I didn't really care. <laughs> hey, you got some behavior to change. I got, exactly. I got the desired uh, effect. So anyway, I, dig nice. I digress. No, that's a good lesson. Uh, yeah, it was. So let's talk a little bit about your work life up until 2012. So what, it, what was your first job out of college? Because I know so there's a lot of job? rooming and veering in your work life, too. Yes. <laughs> uh, so my first job out of college, I was in the marketing department. I was a trainee in the marketing department at the corporate headquarters of Wendy's International, the hamburger chain. Wow. Okay, um, cool. Marketing was the from good Wendy's. News. Okay. Uh, the bad news was my parents were living in Ohio at the time. Uh, I ended up living with them for the next three and a half years as I helped my mom care for my father and my grandmother who were both dying of different forms of cancer. Yikes. So that was that was the downside of that. Uh, after that, I switched. Uh, as a, I was Wendy's about three and a half years, moved to hospital administration wow. for a number of years. That's a pretty uh, big my switch. Wife during that time. And we got married, moved to California. Um, we had our daughter out in California. I was a customer service manager for an academic publishing company. Wow. And I also became a reserve police officer with the city of Santa Barbara, which Santa Barbara. really was not very hard to take. It's, it's right. one of the most beautiful places yeah. I've ever been to. <laughs> um, but then when our daughter was born, we moved to Cincinnati, Ohio. We moved back to the Midwest because that's where our support system was. Right. And I decided to become 
a police officer full time. So started wow. out, you know, went through the academy, was working in a marked car in uniform, answering radio runs. Then I moved, and, and I know you're gonna laugh when I say this. I moved to the drug unit. So I was okay. a six foot eight inch guy who was doing undercover narcotic work. Jeez. But it, <laughs> you know, I always tell people, you know, in that industry, right? And unfortunately, illicit drugs is an industry. Yeah. It's run and motivated by greed. And oh, if yeah. you have money, you'll find somebody to buy drugs from. So did that for a while. I also joined the SWAT team. I was a, a hostage negotiator. On you kind of look team. like a SWAT guy. I mean, yeah. if I'm imagining yeah. a six foot eight guy with a, a haircut like a GI, you kind of look like a SWAT guy. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But I was also smart enough to realize I should be a negotiator and not on the tactical team because the tactical guys, they, you know, they surround the house and sit out in the rain and the snow and all that. Right. Whereas the negotiators were usually in a vehicle and sometimes it's a nice mobile home with a bathroom and water. And right. You're in the command, the mobile, kind of mobile command like, post, basically. Exactly. Totally. Yes. And, yes. and, you know, you guys stay out there and uh, I'll negotiate this person out. But, hey, I need a ham sandwich. Could you, you know, <laughs> throw a ham sandwich in my way? Uh, so so you, did that. Did you do a lot then, of that? Did you actually do a lot of negotiations? Okay. We we did. I, I mean, Cincinnati was is a fairly large city. And it mm -hmm. wasn't just, um, you know, hostage takers. It was, I mean, we would go after somebody get a tip, there's a homicide suspect held up in this apartment. And so we would surround the apartment and we would try to talk them out. So it was, it was a lot of different trying to talk people out uh, situations. Right. And then my wife was always been, has always been the primary breadwinner. She lost her job in Cincinnati and we had to move. We moved to Houston, Texas. So I got out of law enforcement. I started my own school security consulting business. Wow. And I also coached girls high school basketball and probably no surprise, I did coach my daughter in high school. Right. And uh, and that that takes us up to 2012. Wow. That's a lot of, vro of rooming and veering. That's a, a whole lot of different kinds of jobs that are vastly different. <laughs> it is. And, but <laughs> Good if, you you. Understand, if you understand the backstory, and there is one, it makes more sense. So my grandfather was a Chicago police officer from ah, 1924 wow. to 1954 and okay. was actually shot in the line of duty with his own gun. It was not a serious injury. He was shot in the ankle. But my dad always remembered the stories that my grandmother told of that knock on the door. My dad was an infant at the time. This was like 1933 or something like that. Right. Of, of wow. you know, Mrs. Tucker, grab your son, come with us. Your husband's been shot. So when I expressed an interest in going into law enforcement, my dad was absolutely not. You're going to go no. to college. You're no. going to major in business. You're going to get out, get a great job, have two, get married, have 2.4 kids and live happily ever after. Right. And so I, as I mentioned, my dad was, was dying of cancer when I graduated from college. So I had a choice. I could say, sorry, dad, I'm going to go blaze my own trail, follow my own passions or out of love and respect for what you and mom have done for my brothers and I, I will do what you want me to do. So my first two jobs were in business. And I sort of joke, I did what every good son did. I waited till my father passed away. And then I followed my own dreams. Aw. <laughs> that, uh, that's awesome. So, you know, good for you. I mean, I like the fact that you're trying at least. So in your mind, when you were doing those businessy marketing jobs, were you trying to give it a college try or were you actually consciously doing it for your dad? I, I was, you know, I, I learned a lot of good things. Sure. I, I brought some right. life experience to my job as as a law enforcement, as a police officer, which right. if I hadn't have done, you know, if I hadn't done those things, I wouldn't have that experience, right. which I think made me a better cop. But I, I really, I just felt in my heart that I was just marking time, that this okay. was, okay. this is not what I'm supposed to right. be doing. I wasn't excited to get up. I worked right. with great people, learned a lot of stuff, but it just wasn't my passion. I got gotcha. you. Okay. That's, that's very honest answer. Okay. So now we're up to 2012 and, uh, something was wrong with your foot. <laughs> that is so weird. I mean, oh my goodness. So what did it look like? What did this, uh, present as? So at the time I was a, a girls high school basketball coach right. and I had a callus break open on the bottom of my left foot, right below my third toe. And initially, I didn't think much of it because as a coach, you're on your feet a lot. Right. But after a few weeks of it not healing, I made an appointment and went to see a podiatrist, a foot doctor friend of mine. Gotcha. And he took an x-ray and he said, Terry, I think you have a cyst in there and I can cut it out. And he did. And he showed it to me. It was just a little gelatin sack 
with some white fat in it, no dark spots, no blood, nothing right. that gave either one of us concern. Okay. But fortunately or unfortunately, he sent it off to pathology to have it looked at. Good. And two, two weeks later, I received a call from him. And as I mentioned, he was a friend of mine. And the more difficulty he was having explaining to me what was going on, mm. the more frightened I was becoming. Oh, yeah. Until finally, he just laid it out for me. He said, Terry, I've been a doctor for 25 years. I have never seen this form of cancer. You have a rare form of melanoma, which right. we always think is too much exposure to the sun. And right. melanoma affects the melon, the pigment in our skin. Right. But this form of melanoma has nothing to do with that. And it appears on the bottom of the feet right. or the palms and the hands. And there's an even rarer form of melanoma that appears in your mucous membrane. So in your mm. nose or your mouth or right. something like that. And he said, you know, because it, your cancer is so incredibly rare, he recommended I go to MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston to okay. be treated. Right. And that started the saga. I had the, the tumor cut out of the bottom of my foot and right. all the lymph, lymph nodes in my groin removed. Yikes. Um, after I healed, my doctor, my oncologist put me on a weekly injection of a drug called interferon okay. to help keep the disease from coming back. The side effects of the interferon injections were that it gave me severe flu-like symptoms for two to three days every week after each injection. So is interferon sort of like chemotherapy or no? No, interferon okay. basically, it'll kill anything in your body that doesn't belong there. So, I mean, okay. the, the positive side of that was it was also, I, I didn't have a cold or the flu for the five years I was on interferon because it would kill all that stuff. But I took those weekly injections for five years. So imagine having the flu every week for five years. Yikes. And, right. and that was not a cure. That was, as my oncologist used to say, we're trying to kick the can down the road and buy you more time for additional therapies to become available. Oh, wow. So Eventually, basically there was no like sort of specific treatment? No. I, I, melanoma at that time was a death sentence. I, I mean, there really wasn't anything they could do for you. So this wow. their protocol was to put you on this incredibly- Basically just try to keep you alive. Exactly. For science yeah, to catch was, up. That was the whole plan. <laughs> wow. And it was it was That's nasty. scary. That's scary and nasty. It was. It, yeah. it really was. And I mean, I took those, those weekly interferon injections until 2017 when I ended up in the intensive care unit with a body temperature of 108 degrees because mm -hmm. of the toxicity yeah. of the interferon. Right, That's right. That's usually not compatible with being alive. <laughs> right. 108 degrees. 108 degrees. I I, I wow. remember I, I didn't have anything on my torso. And I remember kind of lifting my head up and looking down my body. And it looked like my, my chest and abdomen looked like the hood of a car that had been left out in the sun in August all day. I mean, there were yeah. just yeah. heat waves coming off of it. Right. And wow. They, they pulled my wife out. And I the funny thing about it is here I am, you know, with this incredibly high temperature. I was freezing. I, I was sure. I was in yeah. warm, but and right. as soon as it got to where it was dangerous to me, they pulled all the warm blankets off and packed me in ice. Wow! And gave me this medication, and and I don't remember it. I kind of was out of it at that point. So right. I, right. But my wife told me later the the nurse pulled her out and said, "I've only seen one person with a body temperature this high, and he didn't live." Right. So you know, not, so, probably not the nicest thing you should say to you know the spouse of somebody right. who's being treated. Yeah. But yeah. I ended up in the intensive care unit. And so had to stop the interferon. And almost immediately after stopping it, the disease came back almost in the exact same spot on my foot where it had presented five years earlier. That necessitated 2018, the amputation of my left foot. Wow. 2019, the cancer worked its way up my leg into my shin, two more surgeries. And then finally in 2020, an undiagnosed tumor kind of in my ankle area grew large enough that it fractured my tibia, my shin bone. Wow. And my only recourse right in the middle of this COVID, COVID pandemic was to have my left leg amputated above the knee. Wow. And I also found out I had tumors in my lungs. So yeah, real exciting time. Wow. Okay. So that, that gets us up to 2020. So what was the last two years like? <laughs> so 2020, I, I, I end up, you know, Having so now you're in a tumors. wheelchair, basically, right? I am still. Right. Am. I'm talking to you from a wheelchair right now. Right. And 
um, my oncologist wanted to put me on uh, chemotherapy. And I, and I looked, I'm, you know, I'm eight years into this fight and I looked at him, I'm like, it's going to save my life. And he was like, mm, probably not. Right. I said, well, then I'm not sure I want to do that, you know, go okay. through all that ugliness if the outcome is going to be the right. exact same thing, whether I don't do it. Right. I said, but I'll go home and I'll talk to my family. And, and this is kind of a fun, it's a true story, but it's kind of a funny story. So I, I go home and it's just my wife and daughter and I, and, and I said, you know, doctor wants to put me on chemotherapy. I, I don't think I want to do it. Our daughter's immediately, all right, we need a family meeting. I'm like, family meeting? There's three of us. It's not like we get a board or something like that. You know? It's so me, damn it. Up, exactly. You know, let's take a vote. So we end up sitting around the kitchen table and individually talking about how we feel about me taking chemotherapy. And then when that's done, my daughter's like, all right, let's take a vote. How many people want dad to take chemotherapy? And my wife and daughter raised their hand. I'm like, wait a minute. Am I getting outvoted for something that I don't want to do? Right. But I remember back when I was in the police academy, our defensive tactics instructor used to have us bring a photograph of the people we love the most to class. And as we were learning to defend ourselves, we were to look at that photograph because he reasoned you will fight harder for the people you love than right. you will fight for yourself. And right. so I ended up taking chemotherapy because my wife and daughter wanted me to. It ended up being kind of a bridge to what I've been on for the last two years, which is a clinical trial drug that right. okay. does nothing to the cancer. Uh, the way cancer proliferates in the body is it secretes an enzyme or a protein mm. that hides itself from your immune system. Right, right, right. And what this drug or this combination of drugs does is it gets rid of that protein, gets rid of that that enzyme so that your body can look at it and say, oh, wait a minute, that's not supposed to be or we're supposed to right. kill that. Okay, right, right, right. Okay. So it's your actual immune system that's doing it as opposed to chemotherapy, which is the drug itself that's killing the tumor. Gotcha. So I've been on that for two years. I still have the tumors in my lungs. Um, Yikes. I, I just finished treatment last week. I, I go every week or every three weeks for a week. Then I have two weeks off. And, and that's kind of my life, which I've been doing for the last two years now. Wow. Okay. So it it's not chemotherapy. So taking this, is it, is there like a side effect kind of where you have to deal? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I have yeah, very course. nasty side effects. I, I shake violently. I mean, imagine being cold and shivering, right. like multiply that by like 10. Okay. And, but I'm not cold. And, right. and that. so it's a, uh, it's called rigors. So I riger, I throw up, I have a headache. I have, and I, and I do this for five days and then I get two weeks off and, and I've been doing this for, for two years and the yeah. company just published their results. Yeah. And I was talking to my study coordinator. I'm like, so this is positive, right? We're going to move forward with this. And, he, and she was like, no, they probably are going to have to redo the study. And I'm like, why? She said, because most normal people, which always, you know, that's kind of a shot at me. Most normal people will not go for an entire week of treatment every three weeks. It's just, it's, I said, even if it saves their life, she's like, yeah, even if it saves their life, it's too much to ask people to do. I'm like, those are some pretty weak people. That as far as I'm <laughs> Amen, brother. <laughs> I think, you know, it's like, uh, you remember the movie, uh, uh, war games, yeah. So uh at the the guy that played the the general, right? And they're yeah. they're trying to figure out how to make the robot stop killing us. Right. He's like, look, I'd piss on a spark plug if I thought it would help, right? <laughs> you know, it, that's the kind of attitude that I would take towards if I were diagnosed with cancer. Like, yeah, you know, it's like, oh, I'm also gonna be like you. It's like, do I wanna put up with this? You know, I don't wanna like suffer for a week of, you know, re feeling really shitty if I got a 20% chance of getting better, right? That's not enough, you know, cost benefit analysis kind of thing. But if this is actually helping your immune system do its job, uh, it's probably worth five days of ass pain. <laughs> That's well, sort of, like, yeah. Yes. I, I, right. I, for me, I would take that. Uh, right. it, it is. And I have, and, and I started on this trial with two other people and and they they Quit. died last year. Oh, you know, okay. So okay. so I'm kind of the last man standing, so to speak. Gotcha. And, you know, it, but it's that just talks one about those, this that resolve that we're going to talk about later. You know. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and that's just it. You know, I've got these tumors. The I, I'm I'm at a stable position right now. In other words, 
the tumors are still there. Right. They have shrunk a little bit, right. but they haven't gone anywhere else and right. they're not getting any bigger. Right. So, you know, that's stable. And so now you have to weigh your quality of life versus how much, you know, if you stop the drug, how much will your immune system continue to remember that, yeah, that doesn't belong here and we should get rid of it versus, right. you know, now it's hiding again and it's growing and now I've got more problems. Right, right. Now I'm reading this book that's really interesting. Uh, it's called Lifespan. It's by a doctor. He's not a medical doctor. He's like a PhD doctor at Harvard. Okay. Uh, and I think somebody in his family... I don't remember who, but anyway, he was really basically sort of like mad <laughs> at the medical community because of how they sort of like still have this old, from his perspective as a researcher, like the, the way they treat cancer from the beginning is, well, where did it, where is it, right? And then they classify it based on like body part, right? So for you, it's sort of like, skin right it's like this yeah. weird you know skin right and you know cancer is cancer and it doesn't really matter <laughs> yeah. where it starts right or you know what it's kind of like that it's you know what is it doing to you you know so i think like um in the future as this research gets out there a little bit more you know so i'm saying all of this because i i'm pretty sure in 10 years all the treatments are going to be a lot better and they're going to be specific to you. Like you could go get like a, a genome, you know, where they know all of your genes and they can make treatments just for you. You know, that's what the future of cancer treatment will be. And it doesn't matter where, where it started. <laughs> it's like the dumbest thing. No, you're right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're absolutely right. And, and that's, you know, and my, my oncologist is a, uh, fairly well well known world renowned researcher and oh, nice. he has been working with Moderna That's for awesome. a number of years where people doing just that in studies where they're taking the you know piece of the tumor they're sequencing it right. DNA wise right. and they're developing a vaccine that's specific to your tumor right. and injecting it back into you with this MNRA right. stuff so you know this whole covid stuff is like oh this is unproven technology yeah, I remember no, that's been saying, around like, for years. It's like, it's like 20 Terry, years. I've been doing this for 10 years. Right. Said, this is not unproven. It's not technology. new. It, the only thing that's new is it was the first vaccine. Exactly. That was yes, right. But the MNRA the, the stuff, technology's yeah, been, been around, around for, for 20 years. years. Yeah. I yeah. Know. Right, right. Anyway, yes, we could we could uh, dive into that forever, but I want to get into some of the things where you came up with this, you decided to live. Right. You had to consciously decide that I kind of don't want to live, but I have to. So talk about what you were going through in your own mind. Right. The conversations yeah. you were having with yourself at those really like depressive states where you kind of just are praying to die. But then somehow coming through that, what did you do? How did you get through it? Yeah. So initially when I was diagnosed, you know, I think I went through all the stages that we associate grief. with grief. Right. You know, initially it was denial. It's like, wait a minute, I can't possibly have cancer. I, I've done everything right in my life and blah, blah, blah. You know, and then you get mad and then you start to bargain with God, or at least I did. I right. mean, our daughter was in high school <laughs> yep. when I got cancer. And I'm like, just please let me live long enough to see her graduate from high school. Right. And and then you kind of get down for a while. At least I did. And then I got to a point where it was like, okay, this sucks, but I'm going to have to embrace the suck for lack of a better word. <laughs> yes. you know, these are the cards that I've been dealt. It's not a good hand. I don't like these cards, but I'm going to have to play them to the best of my ability. And I made a conscious decision very early on that I was never going to take out my misfortune on a doctor, on a nurse, on a therapist, on anybody who was trying to help me. And I've seen a lot of people do that. They're scared, you know, they're they're mad, they're frustrated, right. and they project that out onto a nurse or onto a doctor. And it right. was like, look, it they didn't they didn't make you get cancer. You right. got to here to help you. <laughs> right. Why are you doing this, Tim? And, and so yeah, I, and I I think I've done that over these 10 years. I think I've really tried to be kind to the people that are trying to help me. Right. But I, I think you just get to a point where 
and, and you're right. I mean, when I was on interferon, I prayed to die. I, I was so sick of being sick mm. that I was just like, okay, God, I'm done with this. I, just take me out of here. Right. But I also have a very strong faith. And, and God didn't take me out of it, but I really believe he gave me the strength to go on. But, you know, we, mm. I used to talk about winning the day. I got to win today. Well, mm. sometimes winning the day was I got to get out of bed and I got to go to the couch. That's winning the day. Okay. And, and I know right. that people are going to be like, well, that's that's nothing. I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right. It is nothing to you. But to me, <laughs> it was I feel so bad and I hurt so bad. I just want to die. So right. getting from the bed to the couch, that's a big reward. Right. And so you, you have to set up goals, or at least I did. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to do this. And I'm not just going to do it. I'm going to crush it. I'm going to do everything <laughs> I can to be the best at this. Yeah. Maybe I'll fail, but at mm. least I'll get farther down the road than when I started this whole thing. Th that's interesting. So it's almost like you were setting up sort of like doable wins, right? Yeah. You, you made up games that you could win. Right. Within that very small box of suck. <laughs> That's very. Exactly. Yes. Jane McGonigal. She went through this thing where she had like a, a concussion and she had there's nothing you can do beyond just survive the depression after you get this concussion. So she couldn't even get out of bed. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, something very similar. The box. Right. And. So she's th that's what kept her alive too, was she was making up these games because she was a game designer. So that was okay. the first thing that came to her mind. Uh, PhD, you know, really smart lady. Um, but yes, so when you said that, I'm, I'm going to make my goal for the day to get out of this bed and get to that couch. And I'm counting that as a win for the day. Like her sort of thing was, what can I do, right? I can right. look out this window. Oh, look, there's a bird. I'm going to count birds today, right? That is, she just couldn't do anything. She couldn't read. She couldn't watch TV. She couldn't even be about around light, but she could look out the window. It's just like you have to find something to give you a, a meaningful survival strategy, I guess, right? You, a doable you do. win. You need a doable win. You do. And, and I remember when I was in college, I, the Citadel is a military college. Right. And in one year, we had a president – and I don't know if this name will ring to you. You're, you're kind of young, but mm -hmm. a, a guy by the name of, of, of James Stockdale. I don't know. Oh, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Admiral okay. Stockdale. Admiral Stockdale. Yes. So Admiral Stockdale was the highest ranking POW yes. uh, in, in the Hanoi Hilton. He was, he was yes. A, or A4 was shot down over Vietnam. Right. He was captured. He actually won the Medal of Honor for what he did. Right. But I remember being in a in a meeting with him. I, I had very, very, very lucky, lucky, lucky guy. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, was. you. Yes. <laughs> I was. Oh, incredibly. But yeah. I didn't realize it when I was in college how lucky I really was. But somebody asked him, you know, who made it through the Hanoi Hilton? Who made it through the prisoner of war experience? Right. right. And he said, you know, it wasn't the people that were the, the toughest or the biggest or the no. strongest. No. He said it was the people that realized what they could control. Right. And he said, in all honesty, the only thing we were able to control was really our breathing and our thoughts. So right. if you could control those two things, there was a good chance you were going to make it out. But it was the big tough guys like, oh, you know, in six months, we're going to be rescued. Exactly. Like yes. Well, six months had come and they'd still be there. Right. And then they'd fall into this huge funk, this huge depression. Yep. And, and then they'd get sick and yeah. they'd die. Right. And so it was the people who could control the things that they could control. Yeah. And for most of us, that's very small things in our life. Our thoughts. Yeah. You know, our breathing. Yeah. How we treat people and that kind of stuff. I, I heard him. I th I don't know if it was him. I No. So I listened to a podcast with Tim Ferriss. I can't remember who he was talking to. He was talking about Admiral Stockwell and how he went through all these different things. Like the first people that died were the optimists that said, oh, we'll be out of here by Christmas. Yep. Christmas comes and goes. They're, you know, now they've lost hope. So I, the key feature that I took out of that was face it. Face it. Right? You have to stare that in the face. Look. We're all here, and there's a very good chance we could die. It's on us not to. <laughs> right. Right. So that that is an amazing, you know, it's scary, obviously. Most people don't want to even think about that. But he didn't have a choice, right? 
That's the very no. that's it's like a Victor Frankel scenario. Same thing, right? Yeah. He's in yeah, a he's in a you're, you're POW worst, I mean, you right. can't even imagine how bad it is. Exactly. And then, you know, how right. do I how do I win the day? How yes. do I win this day? Yeah. How do I embrace this suck? Yes. And, and right. It was little things like tap codes, you know, that they would communicate right. with each other. Exactly. Tapping on the cell walls. So you had like, that with you in your in while you were in that hospital hospital bed or at home suffering. You you were doing that. You were facing it. You were like, all right, what what is it gonna take today? Right? What is my right. fish head soup? Yeah, I'm not worried about tomorrow. <laughs> There's nothing I can do about yes. yesterday. I, it's today. When, what when, can I do today? When I read the uh Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, and he talked about the joy that he experienced when he saw that extra fish head in his, yeah. in his dirty water, that was yeah. his food for the day. And he was like, Oh my God, all the things that I can do today because I get this extra bit of protein. Oh my God, what a gift. It's like, really? <laughs> it is. Yeah. I mean, and that's how ridiculous things are. I, I yes. and his wife wrote a book. It's called in love and war. And it's a really interesting book because he writes a chapter about like what was going on with him. Yeah. And then she writes a chapter about what she was doing, you know, back in the United States to try to get him freed and stuff like that. Right. And they ended up writing letters to each other and the letters were in code. And so oh, they, wow. they were able to communicate. I mean, the federal government was working with her, you know, here, say this and say it this way and use okay. this word. And he knew what it meant. And, it's an incredibly fascinating letter to your book to read because, you know, he's over in Vietnam being beat to death and yeah. she's here in the United States trying to get him out and kind of what they were doing synonymously as they were going through it. It's called in love and war. It's a pretty good book in love and war. I have to read that. <laughs> it's a great I'm, book. I'm taking it a second here and war. Okay. Because I want to write that down so I don't forget. That was awesome. So, okay, we are uh, getting close to wrapping up. Uh, and thank you, Terry, because this is a blast. But before we do, we have to get this story about MJ, right? Remember, everybody, the story about MJ? Is it Michael Jordan or Michael, Michael Jackson? Who's MJ? Tell us the story. It is Michael, ja or Michael Jordan. Okay. <laughs> so when, when I was a senior in college, uh, our team, I, I played basketball at the Citadel. Uh, it was a, still a Division One school, but compared to North Carolina, where Jordan played, right, uh, not a very big. And every year they would have what they called the North-South doubleheader at the Charlotte Coliseum, and they would take two teams from North Carolina, which were always North Carolina and North Carolina State, and two teams from South Carolina, which were always the Citadel and Furman. So okay. you can imagine the scale. But on Friday night, I got to play against Michael Jordan and the North Carolina team, and that was 1982. North Carolina won the national championship in 1982. Okay. The next night I got to play against Jim Valvano and the North Carolina state team who the following year, 1983 North Carolina state won the national championship. Wow. So in the course of one weekend, I got to play against two national championship teams. Now that's half the story. Okay. The other half is fast forward about 20 years. My brother, the one who I told you about was the pitcher for the University of Notre Dame, right. was a basketball coach at Loyola Academy in Chicago. And he coached Michael Jordan's two sons. Oh, wow. And he tells the story. He said, one day I'm at, I'm at practice and it's toward the end of practice and I'm teaching the players a play and I look up and nobody's paying attention to anything that I'm saying. <laughs> so he said, I look where they look and Jordan, Michael Jordan had come into the gym as a dad to take his kids home after practice, wow. you know, not in any basketball capacity at all. And right. the kids were just in awe of him. And so my brother looked at him and said, Hey, Michael, you're a little bit of a distraction. Would you mind stepping out in the hall until practice is over? And Jordan and his wife are incredibly gracious people. And he was like, yep, yeah, sure. Coach, no problem. Sorry about that. I'll wait out in the hall. until after practice, right. And my brother thought later, I'm probably the only coach in the history of basketball that ever kicked Michael Jordan out of practice. <laughs> That's my Michael Jordan story. <laughs> oh, that's great. He is a really cool dude. Did you see the, uh, uh, I don't know, there's a documentary about. I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. About the Bulls. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so good. So good. Yeah, it was. I, I, I actually, I liked all the stuff that I didn't know about um, Dennis Rodman. Yeah. I didn't realize just how that, now that guy, I mean, obviously Jordan, amazing, right? <laughs> undeniably awesome right in every in 
a, a calculable uh, metric. Um, but Dennis Rodman, he was he was just like one of these fighters, right? You just like I have to find a niche in this game. Right. I, I I'm not going to be the three point shooter. I'm not going to be you know. So he was just under the boards, just fighting. <laughs> <laughs> which which is why he's in the Hall of Fame, right. you know, for his rebounding and his defense, right. not for his scoring and no. stuff. Yeah. yeah, and you know, I don't even think bas. I think basketball has sort of shifted. It, it, oh yeah, it, yeah. I mean, and now like the seven footers are sort of like point guards, and yeah. everything's you out. Be able every, to hit a three pointer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Everything's out of the paint, right? There's there's not a lot of play in the paint anymore, which is probably good. Because we don't need these guys <laughs> getting injured down in the paint anymore. <laughs> well, that's it just, was getting I pretty mean, crazy. I'm old enough, yeah. When I started playing college basketball, there was no shot clock and there was no three point line. Oh, so really? That's how, that's wow. how old I am. I, mean, I, I want to say cow. that those came into a re- around 84, 86. So a few years after I got out, right? Th- th- those came into being. But so I didn't, you know, North Carolina was famous. Dean Smith was their coach. He was famous for what they called their four corners offense. Okay. They would get a lead and there was no shot clock. So they, he had, he would have them spread out and they would, they had this incredible way of passing where, sorry, we're just going to run out the clock and you're going to lose. Ah, and, okay. And I think that's nobody wants to watch like, that. Right. No, it's, yeah. Uh, people are like, no, we need a shot clock because we need the game to be faster and more right, interesting. And, right. And right. Right. So basically yeah. it, you just have to tackle somebody. Follow them, right? Well, I, I'll tell you another story <laughs> if, if you don't mind, real quick. Yeah, so, go for it. Mar- Marshall University was in our conference, and there was a they had a point guard by the name of Greg White. And again, we have no shot clock. They are beating us at our place. They've spread it out. They're going four corners. Right. Well, again, these are you're you're in a school. And when I went there, it's all male, and it's a bunch of cadets. So you know these guys are not you know they're not very wimpy people. For right. <laughs> better way to describe them. They're not and timid. <laughs> they're not timid at all. And so Greg White gets the ball one time and he, he spins it on his finger. Like, the, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. like he's, you know, the globe trotters and, Oh, we didn't like that. And so, you know, he takes it and he throws it to somebody else when somebody comes. And then when he gets it back, he spins it again. Well, Wade Moore was in the far corner. He comes running full speed, hits Greg White with a forearm right in the chest and knocks him like three rows up into the cadet. <laughs> and kind of a funny story. Greg White graduates from Marshall. He goes on to a career where he goes around to basketball camps and he demonstrates ball handling drills and doing the kind of stuff he was doing. Well, my brother was good friends with John Paxton, who played on the Bulls right. with Jordan and stuff like that. And Paxton had a camp and he invited Greg White to the camp to demonstrate. So my brother picks him up at the airport. And they're they're talking and stuff like that. And my brother says to him, are you the Greg White who at the Citadel and Greg White's like, you don't have to say another word. <laughs> yes, that was me. Yes, I was an idiot. I deserve to be sent three rows under those seats. You know, it was just like, OK, enough said. You, you got what you deserved. Now, I, no, I, I would imagine that would be a foul. Oh, it was a foul. He got kicked out of the game. But I mean, it was at the end it was, of the game. We it were was losing. worth it. It's like, it was worth you're it. not going to show us up in our house. Right. Uh, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> no. But the intentional foul is part of the game. But I think he took it a little too far. But that's okay. Yeah. He probably, I mean, I don't the know, guy uh, deserved I mean, it, for sure. You know, beat up Greg White or whatever. In the, you know, as right. he was trying to get out of the stands. But I'm sure he would never do that again. Right. <laughs> He learned a valuable lesson. I bet, yeah, self-preservation. That's right. All right. Well, Terry, this has been a blast. So you are at uh, motivationalcheck.com and uh, talk a little bit about how people can best get in touch with Terry Tucker. Pretty much you can get in touch with me through motivationalcheck.com. Like I said, I put up the thoughts for the day and things like that. I also have recommendations for videos and books to videos to watch books to read, but you can also leave me a message at motivationalcheck.com. And you've got that paid coaching thing. I do. You've and, got and your that, book link a tab there. for that on right. Motivational Check Sustainable Excellence Membership. You can uh, check that out as well. You can also sign up to get a 15-minute free call with me if you want more information about it. Perfect. Terry, this has been a blast. Hang in there. Me too, Jeff. You are like uh, a tough bastard. <laughs> I don't know if you're a bastard, but you're tough. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, when I was a cop, I got called a lot of names. Tough bastard was not one of them. But thank you very much. It, it's that. meant as a term of endearment. That's a military. I, that. <laughs> I I don't know you well enough to call you a bastard. How about your touch tough person? I was going to say hey, son of a bitch. Master works for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for taking the time to ride along with us on another episode of Vroom Vroom Veer. For podcast info and show notes, be sure to head over to vvveer.com. That's triple V double E R.com. Man, that's fun to say. And we'll catch up with you next time here on Vroom Vroom Veer. Vroom Vroom Veer.